Chapter 1. Church. It is now dead midnight. Cold, fearful drops stand on my trembling flesh. Richard 3, Act 5, Scene 3. Kill them all. Let God sort it out. This was a sign in Wayne Wiener Kellestein's window. Jamie Goldberg Flans didn't suspect a thing when the surveillance car slipped behind his luxury sport utility vehicle as he drove out of Keswick, north of Toronto. With him in the gray Infinity FX3 was Paul, Big Paul, Sinopoli, a gargantuan full patch member of the Banditos Motorcycle Club. And when Big Paul was around, it was hard to notice anything or anybody else since he all but blocked out the sun. Flans had just been a prospect member of the Banditos, the lowest rung on the club's ladder for six months. His lowly status meant he was required to be on call for round-the-clock errands like fetching hamburgers and cigarettes or chauffeuring full members like Big Paul. Prospective members like Flans generally performed such grunt work without complaint in hopes that they too would someday be allowed to wear a fat Mexican patch on their backs to announce that they were full patch members in the second largest motorcycle club in the world, behind only the Hells Angels. Given their difference in rank, it made sense that Flans had the chore of driving Big Paul to the emergency club meeting at Wayne Wiener Kellestein's barn in tiny Iona Station, population 100, in rural southwestern Ontario on the evening of Friday, April 7, 2006. Club meetings were called church, holy night, the barbecue, or dinner, and attendance at this particular gathering was mandatory, much to Big Paul's chagrin. Wayne Kellestein's barn was a couple hours drive from the greater Toronto area, where most chapter members lived, and Big Paul was only attending because senior members had made it clear that if he didn't, he would likely be kicked out of the club. The York Regional Police Surveillance Team had been quietly tailing Flans and Big Paul for almost four months, since shortly after a man walking his dogs in neighboring Durham region on December 8th found the body of a small black male bound, gagged, and badly burned in a forested area near the York-Durham region line. The grisly corpse was all that remained of the small-time drug dealer Sean Douse. The reason Flans and Big Paul were on the police radar was a simple one. The last time Douse was seen alive, he was stepping out of a cab late on the night of Tuesday, December 6th, to attend a party at a townhouse in Keswick owned by Flans. In many respects, Goldberg Flans seemed an unlikely target for a police surveillance crew probing a particularly grubby and violent murder. With his shaved head, goatee, pirate styled hoop earring, and muscled up football linebacker's physique, Flans looked intimidating enough. However, if you stopped to look into his eyes, the tough guy effect quickly evaporated. Once you saw his smile in his eyes, his bruiserish appearance seemed nothing more than a carefully constructed persona, much like the performance of his namesake, the professional wrestler Goldberg. He was only playing tough. However, if you stopped to look into his eyes, the tough guy effect quickly evaporated. Once you saw a smile in his eyes, his bruiserish appearance seemed nothing more than a carefully constructed persona, much like the performance of his namesake, the professional wrestler Goldberg. He was only playing tough. Flans was the rare Toronto area outlaw biker who didn't have blue collar roots or a trade that involved soiling his hands. In real life, he had far more money and social status than his biker mentor, Big Paul. Flans' father, Leonard, was a senior partner in a prestigious Montreal law firm specializing in insolvency cases, while Goldberg ran a small computer consulting business that provided on-site technical support to companies. While most of the Ontario banditos didn't qualify for credit cards and lived on the brink of having their cell phones cut off, Goldberg owned a couple of properties, one for his real family and another as a hangout for his bandito friends. His Goldberg nickname was a not so subtle reminder that he was Jewish, which also made him an odd fit in his circle of friends in the outlaw biker world. It was hard to think of any other Jews in Canada's outlaw biker world, but there were hardcore anti-Semites, including the man they were going to visit that day. Wiener Kellestein. It was hard to think of any other Jews in Canada's outlaw biker world, but there were hardcore anti-Semites, including the man they were going to visit that night. Wiener Kellestein was under two lifetime weapons bans, but remained an enthusiastic collector of Nazi memorabilia and military weapons, including machine guns, pistols, bayonets, 
knives and explosives. He encouraged rumors that he was a biker assassin by signing his name with lightning bolts resembling the insignia of Adolf Hitler's Schutzstaffel, the Nazi murder squad more commonly referred to as the SS. Lest that not be upsetting enough, Kellestein surrounded himself with skinhead white supremacists and once cut a massive SWAT sticker onto his farm field with his Skype. He ran a business called the Triple K Securities, a not so subtle nod to the initials of the Ku Klux Klan. Triple K offered a complete electronic privacy telephone taps. Triple K offered complete electronic privacy telephone taps, home intrusion alarms, electronic sweeps for hidden recording devices, and discreet professional service. When he gave Goldberg a business card, Kellestein wrote SS on the back with his telephone number. Many members of the Banditos are considered by police to be criminals, but there was no sound business purpose for Flans to be cozying up to the Banditos. Truth be told, the Toronto Banditos may have had the ambition, but most of the profitable crime was being committed by members of other groups who worked hard at being criminals. Part of Goldberg Flans' appeal to the Toronto area Banditos Part of Goldberg Flans' appeal to the Toronto area banditos was that they could borrow money from him. The attraction the banditos held for Goldberg was harder to define. He might be a whiz with computers and have solid business sense, but he saw himself as more complex than that. And something about the dangerous image of an outlaw motorcycle club appealed to him in a way he himself couldn't fully understand. Aside from Kellestein, most of Goldberg Flans' GTA biker buddies didn't have a problem with the fact that he was a Jew. They might have cringed, however, had they read his profile in an internet chat room where he looked for love under the code name Big Daddy Rogue. At the very least, they would have teased him mercilessly had they read how he wrote, using horrible grammar and spelling. If you are strong enough to love, you have more strength than most. I had that strength and will and the confidence to give what I expect in return. I'm a diehard romantic who believes in giving all of himself when he finds that someone special. He went on to describe himself as a strong man who was searching for something that most have forsaken, true love. He didn't exactly describe himself as an outlaw biker but came close writing, this man comes with a Harley. He also said in the online profile that he believed in happy endings, writing of himself. He is a romantic diehard who still believes in finding this fairy tale. There was no record of his friend and mentor Big Paul Sinopoli also being a diehard romantic unless one counted an enthusiastic love affair with large plates of food and biker brotherhood. Big Paul was 30 years old but still lived with his folks in a basement apartment of their ranch style home set among a thicket of trees in Jackson Point north of Toronto. No one could remember Big Paul ever having a long-standing girlfriend, or any friends at all for that matter, apart from other bikers. He was chummy with a few local Hells Angels, but kept this quiet as banditos and Hells Angels were supposed to be mortal enemies. A one-time security guard and salesman at a sporting goods store, Big Paul dabbled in selling drugs, but didn't make enough money at it to move out into a place of his own. Those who knew him appreciated his quick, easy sense of humor and apparent absence of ego. Those qualities made his bulk less threatening and some women who knew him called him the Big Teddy Bear. Once, he pointed to a black banditos t-shirt that was tightly stretched across his abdomen, smiled broadly and asked biker cops who were standing nearby, does this make me look fat? Privately, Big Paul was extremely insecure about his massive weight estimated as somewhere on the hefty side of 400 pounds. He had been teased about it since his childhood when he immigrated to Canada from his birthplace of Argentina. He had occasionally talked wistfully about returning to South America to rediscover his roots. But his more immediate concern was shedding a couple of hundred pounds to stave off what seemed to be an inevitable heart attack. Although Big Paul was a full member of an outlaw motorcycle club, he wasn't particularly interested in motorcycles and still hadn't paid off his second-hand Harley-Davidson. He was rarely seen on it, since it was in no better shape than Big Paul. <laughs> Perhaps he also knew he wouldn't be like a bear in the circus riding it. While Big Paul didn't love motorcycles, 
He reveled in his version of the biker lifestyle, which offered massive men like himself the prospect of respect, in addition to ridiculous nicknames like Tiny rather than Fatso or Hey You. They might hear in the outside world. While Big Paul didn't love motorcycles, he reveled in his version of biker lifestyle, which offered massive men like himself the prospect of respect, in addition to ridiculous nicknames like Tiny rather than Fatso or Hey You. They might hear in the outside world. A bandito's patch had a way of covering over some pretty glaring imperfections. As fellow club member Glenn Ronway Atkinson noted, how many guys that weigh 400 pounds get laid that often? That evening, Goldberg, Flans, Big Paul, and the police surveillance team snaked their way through down. That evening, Goldberg, Flans, Big Paul, and the police surveillance team snaked their way down South Highway 404 west of Highway 407, and then onto Highway 401. When the Infinity pulled close to the town of Milton, northwest of Toronto, the York Regional officers peeled off, leaving the pursuit to a team of five officers from neighboring Durham region. Those officers were in a minivan and tow trucks, and took turns traveling in front of and behind the infinity, making them hard for bikers to pick out, even if they hadn't been looking. The surveillance team had lost sight of the infinity for almost half an hour before finding it again at the Esso station just west of Westlock at 9.30 p.m. The bikers were none the wiser, and when the officers spotted Goldberg once again, he was talking with two other men. A police officer pumped gas a police officer pumped gas into his tank nearby as the two men got into a silver Volkswagen Golf. Flans didn't bother to fill his tank as he also drove away. The Volkswagen was already familiar to the Durham region officers working on Project Douse and they knew it was registered to Luis Manny Chopper Porchard Raposo, a full patch member of the Toronto chapter of the Banditos who grandly called themselves the No Surrender Crew. Chopper was with another man they would later learn was Giovanni John Boxer Muscadier, Canadian president of the Banditos Motorcycle Club. Chopper Repulso was a different sort of biker than Big Paul or Goldberg Flans. Even though he was considerably smaller than the other two men, his eyes could take on a glassy, crazed quality. And at those times, he looked like a man who would shoot first and often. Chopper Repulso could be painfully polite and respectful, especially on the phone. But whenever he was photographed in biker or social settings, he always seemed to be grinning dangerously and giving someone the finger. It was a hard-edged image for a 41-year-old who still lived at home with his parents in the upper floor of their brick home in a It was a hard-edged image for a 41-year-old who still lived at home with his parents in the upper floor of their brick home in Toronto's Kensington Market area. With this big screen television, glass chandelier, Full bathroom and kitchen, Chopper's place seemed like a tiny urban loft, and it didn't hurt that things his parents paid for. With this big screen television, glass chandelier, full bathroom and kitchen, Chopper's place seemed like a tiny urban loft, and it didn't hurt that his parents paid for his motorcycle insurance as well. Chopper was a good looking man, and there had been a number of women in his life, but none rivaled his mother for strength or love although no one would dare call Chopper Repulso a mama's boy. Repulso held the rank of El Secretario, or security treasurer, of the club's Toronto chapter, the only full chapter of the Banditos in Canada. Despite his druggy demeanor, there was no doubt that he took Bandito club business extremely serious and personally. Despite his druggy demeanor, there was no doubt that he took Bandito club business extremely serious and personal. That night, his briefcase contained club paperwork, including a membership list with the nicknames of all the No Surrender crew, as well as Taz and D, referring to Michael Sandham and Dwight Mushy of Winnipeg. There was also a chart showing who owed what in terms of club dues and a printout of an insulting email he had recently received from Taz Sandham, president of the probationary Winnipeg Banditos chapter. Also in Chopper's briefcase was a loaded sawed-off shotgun, which looked a lot like a pirate's oversized pistol. Club rules forbade such weapons at church meetings, but some instinct told Chopper he was justified in carrying 
hidden in deadly firepower for this night. Boxer Muscadier had agreed for the meeting to be held at Calistine's barn, even though it was an inconvenient drive for the Torontonians. The No Surrender crew didn't have a clubhouse to call their own, and Calistine had pushed hard for the meeting to be held in his barn. Boxer and Calistine had been friends for almost a decade, and Boxer was loyal to a fault where his friends were concerned. Boxer and Calistine had been friends for almost a decade, and Boxer was loyal to a fault where his friends were concerned. In Boxer's worldview, Calistine was his brother, warts and all, and nothing trumped brotherhood. Boxer could sense Calistine was tense about something, but didn't seem too concerned. Calistine was often tense about something. Unlike Chopper Repulso, Boxer went unarmed to the farm that night. Somewhere west of Woodstock, Chopper got a call in his cell phone from Cameron Acorn, another chapter member, who was in jail at the Central North Correctional Center in Penitentiary north of Toronto, awaiting trial on robbery charges. A wistful Acorn asked Repulso to send him a picture of himself, cruising, giving the finger. When Repulso agreed, Acorn told him he loved him. When Repulso agreed, Acorn told him he loved him. I love you too, Repulso replied and then laughed. I love you even though we haven't written. We're lazy cocksuckers. Repulso passed the phone to Muscadier saying, talk to Boxer. I love you bro, Boxer said. In the biker world, too many love you bros is often a sign that something nasty is in the wind. But Boxer was not about to ruin the jovial mood with worries or accusations. They were all adults. They didn't need to be reminded of the power of words of love, especially for those who are plotting betrayal. I hear disturbing news, but I love you, was all Boxer said. At this point, it would have been wholly natural for Acorn to inquire what the disturbing news might be. Instead, Acorn let the statement hang in the air, as he had already divined the problem and didn't want to press things further. It's a cardinal rule that an outlaw biker is supposed to support his president, but Acorn kept quiet that night about any unsettling rumors of upheaval he may have heard, and Boxer didn't press him. Instead, he offered fatherly advice to Acorn, who, at 26 years of age, was 22 years his junior. Boxer sounded like a concerned coach as he advised the younger biker to make productive use of his time behind bars. Don't become like those deadbeats in there. Acorn then asked them to remember him and write him letters. I'll call you guys next weekend. Make sure Chopper doesn't forget about that picture. I'm going to fucking tape it to his forehead, Boxer laughed. In the next few minutes that they spoke, Acorn said, Love you, bro, to Boxer and Chopper 13 times before he finally hung up the phone. Not once did he offer a warning to the men he called his brothers. For a time, the Infinity and Volkswagen seemed to be traveling in tandem through the dark towards the farm. Then they separated, and the police surveillance team stayed with Flans' Infinity. They suspected the Volkswagen was dropping behind them in the type of counter surveillance often used by more organized outlaw biker clubs, but they couldn't do much except drive on. West of London, the Infinity turned off Highway 401 onto Iona Road, past the Cowell McBride Cemetery, and then left down the dirt road called Aberdeen Line to the nasty Iron Gate in front of number 32196. A stone gateway with the Beware of Dog sign opened onto the pothole driveway to Kelestine's dirty white farmhouse. It would have been next to impossible for visitors to see the electric fence that ringed the property, and there was no evidence that Wiener Kellestine's farm actually housed any livestock. There were no more than a few trees along the laneway, as Kellestine had cut the rest of them down years before, so that no one could creep up on them. It was after nightfall now, and the only movement on the unlit laneway up to his farmhouse came from shadows in the moonlight. Up near the house, inside a second chain link fence that stood eight feet tall, was topped with barbed wire, with the rusty shells of a half dozen old cars and an equally run down shed, garage, and porta potty. Behind them was the unpainted barn, and it was too dark to see the wall that had been painted with a white circle that enclosed a white fist and chain, male grabbing a lightning bolt from the sky. 
It was the symbol of Kellestine's old gang, the Annihilators, and if the barn had been better lit, the police surveillance team might have seen that the lightning bolt was in the shape of the jagged SS emblem, so loved by the Nazis. The old farmhouse might have been charming in the hands of someone else, but Kellestine's presence gave it a sinister hillbilly gothic feel. In a window facing a laneway was a sign welcoming visitors with the words, Believe in life after death. Trespass and find out. <laughs> the land around Kellestine's farm was too flat to provide much of an observation spot, and police had no warrant to lawfully enter the property anyway. The Durham team had been following Flans off and on for months, and they didn't want to be seen and compromise their operation. They pulled over on a darkened lane a couple of kilometers away and waited in the troubled silence. They weren't biker cops and didn't know Kellestine's history of membership in outlaw motorcycle gangs, nor had they heard the local folklore of bodies that had been buried in nearby fields in the night after summary executions by Wiener Kellestine. A few minutes behind Chopper Raposo's Volkswagen was a tow truck driven by George Pony Jesson. Besides him sat George Crash Kryrakis, the Bandito's Canadian National Secretary or El Secretario. At age 28, Kryrakis was the second youngest member of the No Surrender crew. He had no criminal record and wasn't involved in typical biker sidelines like selling drugs, running strippers, or acting for muscle as hire. His dramatic nickname of Crash may have rung with the typical biker bravado, but it came from his day job as a tow truck driver, not from outlaw deeds or misdeeds. His choice of dog was decidedly unbikerish as well. Crash was the affectionate owner of a snow white teacup by Sean Frise. Crash clearly didn't have the inner sadness or anger or self-loathing of some bikers. And it was easy to think that his club membership was no more than a youthful phase. Inside the club, it was a given that he would attend Sunday dinners with his family. Despite plenty of chances to carouse with strippers and biker groupies, he invariably shunned them from the company of his wife, Diane. To those he truly trusted, Crash sometimes confided that he wanted to quit the banditos altogether. To those he truly trusted, Crash sometimes confided that he wanted to quit the banditos altogether in order to spend more time with Diane. They had been married for less than a year, and she was the type of smart, loving, successful woman many other banditos could only dream about meeting themselves. Those banditos who thought about such things considered Crash and Diane to be soulmates. Crash's driver for the evening, Pony Jesson, was a fellow tow truck driver who lived out of a dirty white trailer behind a chain link fence in the yard of his employer, Superior Towing of Hito a Bike. Although he was a full member, Pony didn't actually own a working motorcycle, which wasn't unusual in the Toronto Banditos. At 52, Jesson also seemed a little old and a lot sickly for the biker life, and he didn't talk much about how he had been diagnosed with a terminal form of cancer. He wasn't looking for sympathy, just the opportunity to sip a beer in the corner of a room in the final stage of his life, surrounded by men he could call brothers. Also on the road that evening, en route to Wiener Kellestine's farm, was a Pontiac Grand Prix carrying Mike, Little Mikey, Mike T. Trotta, and his close friend, Frankie, Bam Bam Bammer, Celerino, the Toronto chapter president. Tiny as they were, the Banditos had two overlapping hierarchies, with Boxer and Bam Bam, and holding the national presidency. It sounded grand, but there were plenty of titles and a dearth of members. Trotta, a full Banditos member, worked as a used trailer salesman and went home each night to his wife and two-year-old son. He had been with the club for about 18 months and still didn't look really like a biker. With his wisp of a goatee, little Mikey looked more like the type of person you'd see keeping score at a co-ed slow pitch game. His friend Salerno was a man with plenty of vices and inner conflicts, many of which were detailed in his criminal record, which included more than 30 convictions for offenses like fraud and theft. At least one friend traced his troubles back to his childhood with his parents split up. His father ran a successful car dealership north of Toronto and was eager to set him up in business, but Bam Bam preferred to find his own way. His early efforts at self-discovery and outlaw biker clubs 
had been less than impressive. He had been kicked out of the loner's motorcycle club for heroin use, and once he actually burned down the loner's clubhouse when he fell asleep while he was supposed to be standing guard and tending the wood stove. The banditos gave him a fresh start in the outlaw biker world, but he almost blew that too, once getting suspended for non-payment of dues. He often talked with his wife Stephanie about getting out of the club and the outlaw biker life altogether. Bam Bam and Stephanie were celebrating the birth of their first child just a month before a son they named Mario, and Bam Bam had never seemed so happy. He was 40 years old, and they wanted a baby for years, but he told Stephanie it wasn't easy to leave. Do you think this is like a bowling club? Bam Bam asked her, do you think I can just walk away? He had been deathly afraid since the birth of his son, because whenever things went well in his life, they always seemed to be followed by a sickening crash. In the months before his ride to Kellestines, he had the chilling feeling that he didn't have much longer to live. He took out an insurance policy on his own life and counseled Stephanie that it was his wish that she remarry should he meet an early death. He carried a 32 caliber pistol as protection against the nameless threat that dogged him. But he couldn't have been too worried that night as he left it on the back seat of his old BMW back in Oakville before catching a ride with little Mikey. Only a three quarter moon lit their way as they drove up the laneway. Somewhere in the dark, Kellestine's German Shepherd, Kisses, was barking. At 10.15, Goldberg Flans called Boxer and reported that he was going to approach the farmhouse. Flans was eager to prove that he had the balls to deserve his full patch membership. The other vehicles would enter the farmhouse area in 10 minute intervals once Goldberg determined the coast was clear. They might all be biker brothers, but they were also dangerous men, and their host was the most dangerous of all. As he made the first approach in the dark of the farmhouse, Goldberg told Boxer he was keeping his cell phone on. He wanted Boxer to keep his on too, so he could listen in for potential trouble. Boxer okayed the plan, but he cautioned Goldberg that it might be best to wait for them outside the farmhouse. For some reason, cell phones never seemed to work inside Kellestine's farmhouse. Boxer didn't say that much of its interior resembled a shrine to Nazism, but did say Goldberg could expect some trouble. You're going to have some bad reception over there, so you might have to stay outside, Boxer said. His friends would later debate whether these words refer to the bad cell phone reception in the area or troubles from inside the farmhouse. Whatever the case, Boxer's voice sounded uncharacteristically nervous on what threatened to be the longest and last night of his life.